Hi, my name is Fevzi Bilgin. I'm president of Rethink Institute. I welcome you all to today's exciting event. We founded Rethink Institute four years ago as a policy research organization with a focus on issues in realizing peace and justice in the world. So far, we have published quite a number of papers, held many events that serve this mission. We believe that every conflict has political, economic, social dimensions and must be addressed accordingly. We also believe in value-oriented research, meaning that while we lay out facts on the ground accurately and professionally, we also strive to come up with solutions and recommendations that could benefit all and that could be implemented by governments and communities in a sensible manner. In the light of these aspirations, we are now launching the Forum on the Future of Islam. We hope to hold this event annually or biannually under different themes. Washington likes to talk about future and make projections, so this forum will also fit to that trend. Since the end of the Cold War, unfortunately, Islam has become one of the top global concerns. Political, social, sectarian fault lines in Muslim geographies keep producing conflict and violence, affecting not only domestic but also regional and global power dynamics. In addition, in the age of fast, cursory, unfiltered information and continuous news cycle, whatever committed by any Muslim in any place, in any time, with any motive, is haphazardly attributed to Islam. In this respect, it may not be far-fetched to argue that the future of Islam is also the future of Muslims, and that given the magnitude of the issues surrounding this people and religion, the future of Islam will also determine the future of humanity at large. The purpose of this forum is to debate and address the most critical questions, share ideas, and offer solutions to salient issues related to the future of Islam. And this first meeting will aptly take up the issue of extremism and the violence it produces, which has been pre preoccupying the news cycle for a while now. The brutality of ISIS, massacres by Boko Haram, and sporadic murders in the US and Europe are among the latest episodes of violence in the name of Islam. Although Muslims across the world have condemned these killings, massive public outreach has effectively blurred the line between the religion of Islam and the sociological unit of Muslims in the global public sphere. Consequently, the notion of true Islam and the distinction between Islam and the acts of Muslims have come into question. This forum will consider the challenge of extremism and radicalism in Muslim communities around the world, the failure of Islamism to address social, political and economic issues, identity crisis and social predicament of Muslim minorities in Western societies, radicalization of Muslim youth, the conflict between modern values and institutions and the tenets of Islam as conceived by some Muslims and non-Muslims, conflicts among state, civil, Sufi and political manifestations of Islam, and coexistence of Muslim and non-Muslim communities. The forum features prominent American Muslim scholars and experts from DC area and other states who have been working, writing, teaching on these issues. Some others would not join us due to scheduling conflicts. I would like to thank our distinguished speakers for joining us today. Also, these sort of gatherings require a lot of efforts, so I would like to thank my colleagues, staff and volunteers for putting this event together. I also would like to thank individuals and area businesses that make this event possible with their generous financial support. Now. Now let me introduce our great keynote speaker who will surely set the stage for the rest of the forum today. Dr. Aziz Al-Hibri is the founder of Karama, Muslim Women Lawyers for Human Rights, and Professor Emerita at the T.C. Williams School of Law at the University of Richmond. Dr. Al-Hibri earned a B.A. from the American University of Beirut and Ph.D. in philosophy from the University of Pennsylvania before pursuing her JD from the same university. 
After, after law school, she worked as a corporate law associate on Wall Street before focusing her efforts on human rights and Islamic jurisprudence. In 1992, Dr. Alibri became the first Muslim woman law professor in the United States. Since then, she has written extensively on women's issues, democracy, and human rights from an Islamic perspective. Her scholarly works have appeared in, in a variety of publications, including the University of Pennsylvania Journal of Constitutional Law, the Harvard International Law, and Fordham International Law Journal. She has also contributed chapters and articles to a number of collections on legal issues, women rights, and Islam. Dr. Alhibri founded Karama in 1993 to support the rights of Muslim women worldwide through educational programs, jurisprudential scholarship, and a network of Muslim jurists and leaders. Karama's original research and innovative programming provides Muslim women with the essential tools to acknowledge to promote reform in their own communities. In 2007, Dr. Hibri received the Virginia First Freedom Award for from the Council for America's First Freedom. She was also the recipient of the Badi Shabazz Recognition Award from Muslim, from women in Muslim in Islam in 2006, and Distinguished Educator Award from the University of Richmond in 2004. At the request of various institutions such as the State Department, the United Nations, the local universities and Islamic centers, Dr. Ali Breach has shared her perspective at speaking engagements throughout the Europe, Middle East, South Asia, North Africa, and the United States. In 2011, she was appointed to the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom for a two-year term by President Barack Obama. Uh, Dr. Ali Bree's most recent publication is Islamic Worldview, Islamic Jurisprudence, and Amer American Muslim Perspective, Volume 1, and is currently com completing the second volume of this groundbreaking series that revisits traditional Islamic jurisprudence in order to develop a modern, enlightened understanding of Islam with respect to gender, marriage, family, and democratic governance. Recently, Dr. Hibri's work and Karama's activities were featured in a PBS documentary called Gender Equality in Islam. The documentary is available on YouTube. Now, Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dr. Al Hebri. Assalamu alaikum. You hear me okay? Yes. Oh, good. All right. I titled my presentation as Islam and the Current Global Upheaval. As children, Rose and I competed in writing poetry and in various school activities. We played together, we laughed and cried together. And ultimately grew up to go to the university, American University of Beirut together. We experienced each other's family celebrations and crises, but we were as close as sisters. And that was over half a century ago. I was not born yet. <laughs> a few weeks ago, Ruth and I met again over a cup of coffee at the Pancotinia in the city. A few words were exchanged, and then quiet sadness and anger started to grip us. Our beautiful world in Beirut has been demolished. The age of innocence has been replaced with unimaginable ugliness and our lives have spun out of control. For Rose and I grew up in Lebanon. In those beautiful days, we shared the same values and honored each other's traditions. Rose was a Greek Orthodox, but I also had other friends, as she did. Lily was Maronite, Nejla was Shia, Germain was Jewish, and I am Sunni. We never defined each other by our faith, rarely asked, but we celebrated each other's holidays. I always had a part in the Christmas play at school and sometimes preached at assembly gatherings. Even when we studied about the protracted crusader wars, 
It never occurred to me to ask Rose whether Christianity was prone to violence. Nor did I raise such questions with Germain, despite the hot conflict that was developing in the region at that time. And what did Rose ask me when we met, almost half a century later, here in DC? She did not ask me whether Islam was prone to violence. Rather, with sad eyes, she asked me, how could we bring sanity back to this world? How could we share with people our happy childhood experiences of celebrating our diversity rather than banning it? Rose and I decided that we should start a campaign to bring back the beauty of the age of innocence. So what is wrong with being dreamers? The world was not so ugly when we were young, and it is time Best time to repair it. That we can only do together. So let us talk a little bit about religion and violence. The reason that we in Beirut in the age of innocence did not ask whether anyone's religion was violent was because we were all people of deep faith. We were born on the very holy land where all these faiths were revealed. This is why, when I read an article questioning whether Jesus really existed, and I saw such an article, I can only laugh. We know his address. The streets he walked on. Moses and Abraham are as much part of our lives and collective memory as is Ashtar, Yurpa, and Elisar. I hope you know who these people are of the older traditions. The Prophet Muhammad passed through this land in a miraculous journey. His scalers wore simple clothes and moved freely among their people. The story of Khalifa Omar coming into Damascus is quite famous. And he was welcomed by the Christians there. They inspired respect and affection not fear and destruction. These are the caliphs whose titles now is being dragged into the mud by a gang of thugs and misguided youth kept in darkness about their religion by oppressive totalitarian regimes and other dark forces. I think it's important to speak clearly. I was born in the land that really knows what all these religions are about. And each one of them has its own flavor and attraction. They are all our religions, and none of them scare us. Only the extremists do, whatever flavor they come in. As heavenly messages, these religions can only bring about good to humanity. My religion, Islam, for example, demands education for all Muslims contrary to what has been told, not only to all Muslims, but precisely for males and females. It demands that people elect their own leaders freely, and demands that that the judicial system be just to all. You also are expected to be a witness, even as against yourself, or those who are closest to you. For as the Quran tells us, God gave dignity to all the children of Adam. Not only to me, not only to those ones in the audience, to everybody. That's what a human being is, dignified. Most importantly, the reason that my religion and Christianity and Judaism prohibit usury is not only because of economic considerations, as is usually given in an interpretation. Let's look who are the people who write on this here. <laughs> there you are. More importantly, it is because injustice, economic or otherwise, sooner or later gives rise to conflict. Conflict is despised in Islam. Any contract, even a marriage contract, or an oath, or a business contract, that is likely to give rise to conflict is deemed invalid 
because justice and harmony are our core values and they flow from the unicity of a beneficent God. If you really want to know more about this, this is not an ad, but start volume one, volume two will speak more clearly about this issue. These murderous gangs, mysteriously, mysteriously financed, armed to the hilt with the latest technologies, dressed in the freshest outfits, and equipped with caravans of Toyotas, present themselves as the protectors of Islam, as they slaughter thousands of innocent Muslim civilians. The prophet says clearly that only God can punish with fire, so that not even an anthill can be burnt in Islam. Yet these gangs burnt a young Muslim pilot and were proud to regurgitate it to the world. Where are their Muslim values? The world cringes in disbelief, but not much happens. Financing continues. Supplies arrive on time, and so do the weapons. What mysterious forces are supporting them that cannot be stopped, sanctioned, or even sued for war crimes? Or have we started believing in magic? Is this dropping? upon them from heaven somehow? Yet, the easy refrain is to blame, to blame it all on Islam and move on. Not this fast. This time, the price is just too high for everyone. To understand the present, it always helps to understand the past. So let us examine the history of the American view of Islam. Islam is often viewed as an Eastern or Oriental religion, which is in its very essence incompatible with democracy and disrespectful of human rights. Its recent visibility in the United States and Europe does not appear to ameliorate this view. American Muslim immigrants, for example, are viewed even today as somehow alien to our system of democracy and human rights, and hence perhaps suspect. The recent occurrence of ISIS-like activities in our land has only given fodder to an already bad situation. The suspicion of Islam and Muslims is deeply rooted and has had historical manifestations as in this country as early as the 18th century. In other words, current events are not creating a new attitude. They are awakening an old Orientalist predisposition. During that period, several American novels, for example, featured either fictional Muslim spies in America or oppressed women in the harem. These are the precursors of some Hollywood films and TV programs today. By the way, the story about the woman in the harem, she was saved by a white man on a horse, if I remember correctly. Yeah. We're still trying to save these women. Many 18th century authors, from Voltaire to Prudhoe and Molny, wrote important works about Islam that were eagerly read in the United States. Unfortunately, some authors were not quite concerned about historical accuracy. Various books about Islam, which appeared in the 18th century, created an atmosphere of disdain, hostility, and distrust of Muslims. Amongst them was a book entitled The Nature of the Imposture. The message of the book was that false religion, as Islam was often referred to in those days, and military power could combine to subdue a people. Another book, now you see all, these, all this is happening, there was no Muslim voice in the US at that time. There were Muslims, but no Muslim voice. Another book entitled Cato's Letters, an English work which became highly influential in this country, pronounced the Prophet Muhammad a tyrant 
and argued that tyrants like him prevented the free expression of ideas. In support of their view, authors cited the example of the Turkish Empire and other Muslim states, which they said frowned on printing and other forms of mass communication. Now, we're going to be seeing through my remarks what this country thought of the Turkish Empire at the time. It is their impression and understanding of it, not necessarily what the empire was about or, or how it conducted its business. Other authors corroborated these views directly or indirectly. Even Volney, who was a great admirer of all civilizations, could not but comment on the state of apathy and indolence that had permeated many Muslim countries. Volney and many other writers were concerned about the reason for the decline of Islamic civilization. They wanted later civilizations, especially the American one, to avoid a similar fate. Their conclusions varied. Some blamed what they perceived to be the Islamic attitude of fatalism. That was what's behind the decline of the Ottoman Empire. Others blamed what they believed to be the Islamic lack of encouragement of free thinking. There was, however, general agreement that tyranny fostered by religion and the Muslim people's acceptance of it were at the heart of the problem. Notice we keep hearing about the lack of freedom of thinking in Islam. Not in Islamic societies, but in Islam. The mixing between the two and changing a cultural problem to see it as a religious problem. Subsequent discussion centered on how the American system of governance could avoid such a fate. Nevertheless, Islamic constitutional precedents played a part in the constitutional debates in the United States. For example, Alexander Hamilton argued for giving the federal government the right to impose taxes by referring to the example of the Ottoman Empire. He noted that the sovereign of that empire had no right to impose a new tax. As a consequence, he permitted the governors of the provinces to impose these taxes and then squeeze out of them the sums he needed for his and the state's expenses. Hamilton concluded, who can doubt that the happiness of the people in both countries would be promoted by competent authorities in the proper hands? In the debates of 1787, Anti-federalists, using what they judged to be the example of the despotic Turkish government, argued against a strong central government and demanded guarantees of individual liberties and religious freedom. I think it is important that at one time we make our own studies as Western Muslims of actually what did the Ottoman Empire look like, not what it was perceived as in the West. In particular, Webster, Henry, and Dollard spoke of the evils of Turkish despotism. Alexander Hamilton, on the other hand, saw deeper into the Turkish example, recognizing a complex power structure. He argued that from one perspective, the Turkish Sultan was in fact weak and had limited powers. Hamilton then concluded that a strong central government I is stronger than the Sultan, so they could not agree whether the Sultan was strong or weak. A strong central government would protect people from oppressive local governments. The West, looking from the outside, viewed Muslim regimes as embodiments of Islamic principles. Nothing could have been further from the truth in many cases. This Western outlook made it more difficult for most authors to understand or present Islam as it is, as it was truly revealed in the Quran. This problem has persisted in various degrees in this country for the last couple of centuries, and today it is at a crisis level. While Islam and Muslim countries were understood by the American population from the point of view of the other, 
Some founding fathers were made a serious effort to educate themselves about Islam and its civilization. Despite these efforts, the founding fathers attempts to avoid what they saw as the underlying reasons for the failure of democracy in Muslim countries were ultimately misdirected. They were based on inaccurate or incomplete information and unreliable analysis. Many founding fathers were not as uninformed about Islam as the rest of us may be even today. Indeed, some made a special effort to read about Islam and related ancient civilizations. For example, Thomas Jefferson's library contained at least one copy of the Quran and was rich with books about ancient civilizations, including Islamic ones. Jefferson appeared to consider his knowledge of these matters important for the development of the American model of political governance. And in that approach, he was not alone. Medicine, for example, read about ancient confederacies before formulating his own proposal for a federal system in the United States. The resulting system, however, was decidedly American. It is therefore not surprising that T.J. Barlow reported to Jefferson from Paris that the federality of our system of government is not at all understood in Europe, even in theory. The best writers don't know what we mean by it. I find it easier to understand because I have the charter of Medina. Over a thousand years ago, executed by the prophet among different tribes, introducing the notion of federalism, religious freedom, and freedom of conscience. It is sometimes easy to forget, and by the way, I should say, I started uh, Jefferson uh, research uh, to try and understand how much exposure he has had to Islam and whether there was, in fact, any influence from his readings on his later contributions to the American Constitution. The research is still ongoing, and one of the things we need to figure out is whether any of the founding fathers at one time did actually read the Charter of Medina or were familiar with it. It is sometimes easy to forget how exciting was the period in which our founding fathers lived. It was a period in which they felt that they could design a system of governance from which the rest of the world would greatly benefit. They took that responsibility seriously. So while the general public was referring to Prophet Muhammad as an infidel and an imposter, Jefferson was reading the controversial books of Walmy on ancient Middle Eastern civilizations, as well as corresponding with him. He even quietly translated parts of Walmy's controversial book entitled The Ruins, which discusses Islamic civilizations among them. Jefferson asked Walmy to keep this fact confidential, a testimony to the political pressures of the time. Not much has changed. Not all that the founding fathers read about Islam was negative. Despite popular opinion, some concluded that they needed to have a better understanding of Islam in order to reach a correct analysis. For this reason, Jefferson and others read many books that the public found highly controversial. Furthermore, as I already mentioned in talking about this matter, Jefferson owned at least one copy of the Qur'an, and it was sales translation of the Qur'an. Sales, by the way, was very famous in Europe, and the salons of Europe would congregate to study his translation. The first volume of sales Qur'an consisted of the author's exposition and own assessment of the Prophet Muhammad and the religion he professed. You can go to the Library of Congress, Rare Books Division, and ask to see the two volume uh, uh, copy of Sales Quran. In a gesture towards public opinion, Sales refers to the Prophet as an infidel and an imposter. 
The thrust of this discussion, however, is to provide a fair assessment of an individual and a religion which was gro grossly misunderstood in this country. In an introductory statement to the reader, Sale stated, and I'm quoting now, I shall not here inquire into the reasons why the law of Muhammad has met with so unexampled a reception in the world. Quote, uh, parentheses, for they are greatly deceived to imagine it to have been propagated by the sword alone. Close parentheses. Or by what means it came to be embraced by nations which never felt the force of Mohammedan arms, and even by those who, which stripped the Arabians of their conquest and put an end to the sovereignty and well-being of their caliphs. A few pages later, Sayyid added, For how criminal soever Muhammad may have been in imposing a false religion on mankind, the praise is due to his real virtues, but not to be denied him. He was trying to speak in a way that would not on, uh, earn him the condemnation of the audience. Later, Sale concluded that the Prophet's, quote, original design of bringing pagan Arabs to the knowledge of the true God was certainly noble and highly to be commended. Sale embarked on a long, admiring description of the Prophet's personality and moral character, followed by long, detailed chapters on Islamic history, theology, and law. In the course of discussion, he disposed of many negative myths about Islam. He also compared Islamic law and Islamic, uh, Islam's historical track record with that of Christianity and Judaism, pointing out that Islam has done no worse than the other two religions. One point made in this manuscript is particularly salient in light of Jefferson's writings. Sale stated that the Prophet declared that his, quote, business was only to preach and admonish, that he had no authority to compel any person to embrace his religion, end of quote. This point is as you know, reiterated by the Qur'an itself, which is translated in the second volume of Sayyid's Qur'an. Jefferson, who had this, this two-volumed work, expressed a similar point of view in his writings about freedom of belief. In fact, in one of his writings, Jefferson argued that society should be tolerant of religious practices of others, so long as they do not harm the good of the state. So he gives the example of killing calves or lambs. Where does this come from? This appears to be a reference to the Islamic annual custom celebrating the event when the son of Abraham was spared by God and lamb was sacrificed in his stead. If so, then Jefferson must have been thinking of slave practices in America, since most Muslims at that time were slaves who were brought forcefully from Africa. This raises a further question of the extent of context between Jefferson and other founding fathers and their slaves, and how many of those were Muslim. Exchange of ideas. I mention all this to bear the historical roots, which combined with the current madness of violent facts here and around the globe, have given rise to a surreal climate, where questions such as, is Islam prone to violence, can be presented as a serious academic subject of discussion. Of course, no one would entertain the same question about, say, Christianity. Is Christianity prone to violence? I wouldn't ask that question. Why? Because we know Christianity. The pilgrims were Christians. The founding fathers were either Christians or deists of Christian roots. So Christianity is not a stranger to this land. If acts of violence happen by Christians, we know that they are not representing their religion. They are just violent extremists. So. Christianity, not being a stranger, helps us understand that we need not even ask that question because it doesn't make sense. 
but Islam is a stranger in this land, despite the many centuries it has been here, because it has been voiceless. It is the other, and so long as it is the other, and combined with the state of instability in Muslim countries, which has spread worldwide, our people will react with irrational fear and unrestrained condemnation when an act of violence is committed by an extremist and he turns out to be a Muslim. For example, it appears that George Pataki of New York has declared, declared war on radical Islam. I saw this yesterday. He says in a tweet, I'm declaring, we kill them. Go ahead, arrest me. The tweet is sort of unclear. Does he want to kill me, or ISIS, or both? Or has he confused one with the other? Is the Constitution put on the shelf for now? Will Muslims be in turn to protect them from the wrath of the rest of the population? Will we see a domestic Guantanamo that also knows no due process? nor recognize established rights? Scoundrel time of the slavery period, World War II, McCarthyism, and September 11, and many other grounds, has returned yet once more to our shores. I use the term scoundrel time as the title of Lillian Helmer's book about her experience. It's up to us to deal with it. And on our actions depends the very future of this country. I don't think we're talking about the future of Islam. We're really talking about the future of this country. Will we continue to blossom as the modern counterpart or of the beloved Muslim Andalusia, which gathered under its skies a conglomerate of interfaith leaders, scientists, authors, and artists? Or will we shrink in fear into ourselves and abandon our lofty principles. Rely instead on our superpower status. Living a principled life requires courage. We need to fight for what we believe in and protect it from harm. This means that we need to hold each other's hands and form a protective shield around this country based on faith in each other and on compassion, not suspicion. This requires a lot more than coexistence. Can we do it? You bet. Just ask me and Rose. Thank you. We have, uh, we have about 10 minutes for uh, questions to direct to Dr. Henry directly. Please uh, push one of those microphones and uh, press the button so we, everybody can hear and we can record the questions. Yes, sir. Could you approach? Yeah, and just there's a button on it. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Leon Weintraub. I'm uh, retired from the U.S. Diplomatic Service. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, in listening to your remarks, which were very, very enlightening, well, first of all, I have to say I'm hardly an expert on Islam, so anything I, I say uh, is probably is a lot out of ignorance. You spoke about the criminals, thugs, violence, about the murderous gangs. Um, you spoke about the Boko Haram, what happened in Paris. I think what you said about Islam is very helpful in explaining the nature of, of Islam, uh, any relationship it may have to violence, to, to people like me who are interested in being educated and hopefully to a wider American audience that's all for the good. I think what, what is needed 
is to influence the perpetrators of the violence, whether the Boko Haram or the people who acted in Paris. I doubt very much, with all due respect, they will be influenced very much by what you say or what others like you say. Uh, I know there are efforts in France and in the United States for the local authorities, the national authorities, to speak with imams about what they're saying at mosques. Uh, and I, I feel that these young people who are prone to violence because they're disaffected, whatever reason it may be, if some imams speak one way or some leaders speak another way, and it doesn't suit their preconceptions, they'll just go look for another one. Now, as far as I know, in the absence of any global authority or world leader of Islam whose word would be written and accepted, are there leaders with such sufficient stature that they could off as a lunatic French, or whatever, or whatever is the appropriate way to do it, to say, whatever these people say, whether it's Boko Haram, or these people in Paris, ISIS, the, these are not, have no way, have no way to claim to be doing whatever they're doing in the name of Islam with such authority, with such force that these people, you dry up new recruits for this type of adventure. I don't know if it would be a political leader, a, a, a leader of established uh, uh, figures like Al-Azhar University. I'm looking, is it, are, are there such type of, of, of leaders available, and, and is that advisable? So I got you with your point. So let me first say that when I talked about murderers, spies, and gangs, I was not talking about the bulk of these movements. I'm talking about a small, a group within them. The bulk I really care about is the misguided youth, our youth, our children, that think that they are defending Islam and that therefore are sitting ducks for these people to attract them into their be and that behavior and also dispose of them because we're, we're, they're being killed in, in large numbers. And the only reason our youth is really open to being exploited in this way is that we have not concentrated on their education as they were growing up so that they will have from within them first a good understanding of Islam and a strong uh, intercultural, uh, a strong humanistic uh, uh, and conflict resolution abilities. We understand this as Karama. That is why, for example, one of the things we've been doing is conflict resolution training for, for imams. So that they will train the people in their, in their mosque if they feel frustrated, if, if they have marital discord, any kind of conflict, what is the best way to solve it peacefully? This is why we at Karama concentrate about writing the kind of Islamic views that are really rooted in tradition but accommodate culture, as all jurists have said across the time, that when you interpret Islam, you have to take the milieu into consideration as you explain it. So you're going to tell me you can write all you want. Who is reading? And the call for a central authority in Islam who can tell everybody magically, this is what Islam is, follow me, for me is dangerous. We are not organized in a hierarchy. We're organized in a democratic system. That's what people need to know regardless of what they think about Islam, to each his view. I don't care if the ISIS people think what they think. They're entitled to think that Islam requires A, B, C, and I think something else. But they're not entitled to kill. They're not entitled to violence. They're not entitled to harm society. The Quran says to kill a soul is like you kill the whole of humanity. It's so clear. That's where we need to talk to them about it. That's where we need to build in the new generations all around the world and not just in the U.S. a consciousness 
of the importance of legality. When you get frustrated, there are channels to go through. There are ways to get your pride. The Prophet followed them. The Khalifas followed them. And you need to follow them. What is required for this to happen? First of all, I think it's most, it's extremely important, and I wrote this in the 1990s in a UN document, it's important that we start reconciling governments with their people. That, at that time, sounded like a weird suggestion, but right now, others over the, overseas are starting to talk about it. A government which is in conflict with its own people cannot really govern effectively, nor would the people find the legal channels to get to where they need to get. Additionally, we need to start fighting corruption as a group. Muslims around the world need to fight corruptions in governance. There has to be organizations that transcend nationality, that follow the Islamic principles of being honest and servant of the people, and stop the horrible corruption that's happening in governments, so that there would be judicial bodies, pan-Arab, pan-Islamic, uh, that are going to look into any kind of uh, frustration or, or complaint by, by Muslims against someone else in power. We also have to educate. Karama is also trying to educate overseas and not only here. But we are one organization. This has to happen on global level by people who have more power than we do. Global organizations that are Muslim, that you know, are recognized as a Muslim alliance of different views. It's not just going to be uh, you know, it's, it's shameful to talk Sunni Shia. I never grew up to talk about that. We need to go back to talking about Islam. And, and then present a curriculum for schools, present uh, um, institutions for governance, institutions for justice and, and judiciary that follow these principles. It's a long, long haul. It will take time. We have to start right away. We have to accelerate it. I'm doing what I can. Others are doing what they can. But that is the solution. It's not magical, and it's not going to happen today, and it's not enough to just remove the imams and replace them. Where are you going to get the other imams from? How many imams have been really educated in detail about Islam? Ask me. I've been ex uh, given expert testimony in courts. And I have listened to imams on the other side, either not knowing what Islamic law is or mischaracterizing it. A situation that ended with negative decisions on the part of the court. Not because of their fault, but because some imams just don't know what Islam is about. So we need here a peaceful revolution in education at various levels and, and in governance before we can go back to peace. I think that's a long-term solution. All right, let's have one last question. Go ahead, sir. My name is Mike Gauss. I'm with the American Muslim Institution. You mentioned a, a question and a comment. You mentioned about the Medina Charter and the research is going on to find if any of our presidents, founding fathers, have read it. I need to know the status on that. Well, number two, the same charter is in a similar fashion is applied in Indonesia called Panchil. Yes. And also in India, yeah. it is similar to Medina Charter. Each society governs by its own laws. My comment is, we have to learn or propagate the idea that you blame the individual for the wrongdoing and punish the individual, his parents, children, pastor, mayor, city, religion has nothing to do with the crime that individual committed. On the other hand, barking at the religion provides no justice. You bark, you cannot kill the religion, you cannot slaughter, you cannot shoot, you cannot kick, you cannot bury. Why bark at it? Bark at someone that you can punish and restore justice in the society. Punish or re-educate, because many of, of, of these people are uh, really misguided youth, and uh, to try and educate them would be a great thing to do. But you're right, in Islam there is no collective punishment, 
Neither is that or should be in the United States, although we now hear of collective punishment of families and so on. On the first question about the Charter of Medina, my research took place in Jefferson um, a few years ago. And this, this kind of part of this work has been published. My main researcher was a student of mine. And she actually picked the topic. And she was Christian, and very devout Christian. Um, I look for her to, uh, to her to lead this project in its next um, uh, in reincarnation on the Charter of Medina, etc. What is stopping us, of course, is that the Founding Fathers did not just live in the U.S., they lived in Europe. We have real good information on where also some of the uh, data might be in England, etc. So we're, it's now a financial issue to get the kind of grant that would allow us to do all this research and show that Islam is not a stranger to this country or to this constitution, that we are not an other. We are like everybody else and that we will hold hands together to build this country. And yes, we need to make change around the world, and we are great leaders to lead it, if, if given the chance to do so. Thank you very much, Dr. Ingrid, for all these insights. Well, please. <laughs> now let's have a five-minute break, and let's reconvene in this hall for the first panel.